respected, respected Provost Chancellor, Professor Rajni Gupta, Director, Professor, um, and other faculty members from symbiosis as well as other business schools and ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me to be here today to deliver a speech on changing landscape of business in a global village. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Symbiosis Institute for organizing this conference on an appropriate and selecting an appropriate theme, taking into account the process of globalization and the challenges and opportunities brought about by the forces of globalization and, and changing landscape of global business, changing landscape of business in the world. There is no doubt that the globe has changed the landscape into the global village. Gone are the days of restrictions on foreign investments and here comes the days of open economy. Gone are the days of restrictions on imports and here comes the days of free economy in which you can import whatever you want to import. And globalization has become an irreversible process. I would like to uh, focus more on uh, the changing landscape with reference to China and India, taking into account the process of growth of China and India, and in the context of US and Japan, where I've been working as full-time faculty member uh, during the last couple of years. I also maintain an author page where you can uh, watch some of the academic videos relating to international business as well as emerging markets. That's the reason I'm showing. So this is my author page. This is accessible to everyone. No need for password. So in case if you want to watch some of the videos that I use as part of my speech today as well as as part of my teaching in the US as well. Globalization has become an irreversible process. 10, 15 years ago, some people were talking whether globalization is going to be reversible or reversible. But nowadays, almost all the experts have come together to agree that the globalization has become an irreversible process. It's no longer a myth. So we have to liberate, we have to learn how to liberate the opportunities arising out of globalization process. We have to realize that globalization is like a coin where there are two sides, challenges on the other side and on the other side, opportunities. How to maximize the opportunities for each one of us? How to maximize the business opportunities for your organization? How to become globally competitive? How to create globally competitive organization? These are the needs of the hours. So the need of the hour is to think in those lines, is to have global mindset, is to groom yourself as global citizen, rather than grooming yourself or rather than grooming um, your counterparts in any other country with a local uh, citizen framework. So global citizens and global organizations and globally competitive companies, these are, the need, these are very, very critical for success in the days to come. Recently, um, I was watching a, a video, and, and uh, first I watched from television. So uh, the president of US, Mr. Barack Obama, he went to address America's young generation, and he told them students in China and India are hungry, and they are more hungry than you. So hungry for what? Mm -hmm. In America, students learn only one language. In India, students learn, students try to learn three languages, right? 
In America, people work only five days. In India, people work six days. In America's business schools, in America's education institutions are open only for five days. America's banks are open only for five days. And Western countries, Japan, take the case of, in, in, in Japan, people spend uh, more time in the office even though they work only five days. So compared to all those countries, Indians tend to work more, Chinese tend to work more. And as a result, we are witnessing um, very high economic growth rate in these countries, even though countries like China and India, they have their own challenges, which include huge size of population and, and so many other challenges. So what President Obama was trying to talk to America's young generation was, they were, he was trying to motivate them, he was trying to tell them that the kids from China and India would come and grab your jobs because they are more hungry than you for knowledge, they are more hungry for jobs, they are hungry and they are going to compete with you in the days to come. And unless and until you learn how to compete with the kids from China and India, they will come and take away your job. That was the message he wanted to convey to the America's young generation. And let me also tell you based on what I have seen in different parts of the world, the hardworking people, because in <laughs> India, hardworking people, uh, there are a lot of lazy people in India as well, but the, 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 there are many hardworking people in India, and Indians tend to spend more time. So looking at that, you can say, you would see more number of hardworking people in, in countries like China and India. So which also result into, um, uh, you know, the improving the position, which result into, um, which helps India and China to grow as uh, second fastest and fastest growing economies on the planet. Uh, for example, I, I would like to try to correlate with the four P's that you learn in marketing management. When you learn marketing management, you talk about price, product, promotion, and place, right? And in America, people learned that in, in their books. But at the same time, America's uh, business school students like four more P's in addition to the marketing four P's. Those four P's are uh, party, part-time job, paycheck, and power. And also one more, performance. They also believe in performance. So in India, I'm not sure that you like all these four P's. There is no concept of, I'm just trying to compare with the uh, system in, in India with system in, in the US. Um, they have a part-time job culture, almost every student. In India there is a part-time job culture. And uh, paycheck is very, very important in the US. And it's considered as the most important concept, most important uh, or most preferred um, uh, by the students, by the young generation. And Indian students like one P which uh, someone else, um, you know, maybe I don't know, uh, what could be your answer if I have to ask you, because majority here are students, right? What do you like? Party. I would say Indian students like, uh, the, the most favorite Indian P could be parents. Mm -hmm. And party maybe number two. Yeah, so... Let me try to uh, try to try to link uh, the changing landscape. When you talk about global village and changing landscape, India has become the second fastest growing economy in the world, and China has become the fastest growing economy in the world. China has 1.3 billion people. India has got 1.2 billion people. This creates some sort of pressure on China and India. At the same time, the growth we have to also try to analyze the reasons for why India has become the second fastest growing economy and why a lot of people from different countries these days try to come to India in terms of uh, capturing the market share in different industries. If you fly from uh, you know, Europe or Japan or China or US to India, you will see at least 50% of the people these days are non-Indians, they are not Indians because they are coming here for doing business because they understand the importance of India as a market need not be India as a country but they, they are very very interested this is because India has emerged as one of the BRIC countries and the second fastest growing economy and with three E's like, like uh, English, 
education and engineering. India has got the largest number of engineers as of now. India has got the second largest number of English-speaking people in the world. And India has got the largest number of undergraduates passing from India's universities with a privatization in the education sector. And, and India's English-speaking people, the number, not the number of people speaking English, uh, the maximum number of people would be in India 20 years down the line because India's population is increasing. And in case if, if 300 million people speak English in India out of 1.2 billion people, uh, that would be equal to the total size of America's population. And in, in China's case, China's success can be linked to the exports, exports growth. And India's, uh, India is successful in export of human resources, and China is uh, doing excellent job in export of commodities. Even Delhi's Chandni Chowk has emerged as Chinese Chowk, right? <laughs> so globalization has brought about import tariff levels and created an open economy. And the, the need of the hour, uh, uh, the buzzword in, in different industries these days is go global and grow global. And you need appropriate strategy for your organization, you need strategy for you as well. And a strategy of the day, uh, who, are the, uh, who are the successful organization? If you actually try to do research on secrets of success of uh, multinational corporations, those who have succeeded in the market, those who have achieved, those who emerged as role model companies, they all have focused in the global markets. You name Infosys, you talk about Microsoft, you talk about McDonald's, you talk about Starbucks, you talk about all those successful companies. The, the brands, the top of brands, the brands that come to your top of mind, they all have succeeded mainly because of their business strategy, go global and grow global. And there could be an opportunity in the middle of every difficulty. There could be an island somewhere else so that you can see, you know, uh, Christopher Columbus discovered the U.S. long back. U.S. was not a country, right? So he crossed the sea. And, and he landed up in a different place and, and, and that was a place for many opportunities for millions of people later. And the same way if you go to Singapore, Tamil is the official language there, Malaysia. So because uh, Tamilians have created, Tamilians went down to cross the sea and, and, and Singapore, they, they ended up in Singapore. Malayalam is an official language in UAE. So this, this kind of global Global, uh, and if you go to UK, you would see direct flight from Ahmedabad to London. This is because Gujaratis have created niche for their people in London. So direct flights from Ahmedabad to London. So this this is all uh, examples for going global and achieving success. Because sometimes getting acceptance in, in your own market could be difficult for organizations as well as for people. There could be opportunities somewhere else. I can also try to talk about some more examples. General Motors, GM. GM is immensely successful in Chinese markets. At the same time, because of global financial crisis and uh, problems in the US, GM had gone bankrupt in the US market in, in 2009. And GM's China business has become jewel it just, it's like a jewel in the, in the GM crown. So this, so this is sometimes possible. Suzuki, Suzuki Motor Corporation, I can tell you. I, I told you I was uh, working in Japan and I lived in Japan for almost uh, four years. And um, in Japan I have seen Toyota and Honda are the leading players in the automobile industry. Suzuki, even though it's a Japanese company, Suzuki is not successful in home country Japan. But Suzuki is really, really successful in Indian markets. So this kind of stories, if you actually talk about this kind of examples, there are several companies, those who haven't succeeded in the home market have succeeded somewhere else. So all these stories, there are several other examples as well, all these stories gives us enough insights to argue the case for go global and grow global and, and changing landscape of, of the 
uh, world has facilitated uh, entry of companies from one country to other countries in different forms using different permutations and combinations. It could be franchisee, it could be uh, by way of setting up joint venture, it could be by way of licensing, it could be by way of exporting, it could be by way of uh, creating subsidiary, uh, it could be by way of acquisition or uh, different strategies can be used, but this is the need of the hour. And let me talk about uh, some background information. In India, when we talk about India, India is largest democracy with 100 plus political parties, and India needs to globalize or internationalize much more because Indian companies got freedom to internationalize only in, in 90s. Before that, their hands were tied up. So when Japanese or American companies or European companies were going global, Indian companies were not taking steps to go global. So they were late movers in the global market. So that means there is need for uh, aggressive steps or assertive steps for companies to go global. So nowadays there are no restrictions on foreign exchange for importers as well as for going global. There are a lot of restrictions have been taken away. There are few restrictions remain. And I have a question as a kind of food for thought. Globalization, does it lead to success? If you talk about software companies from India, almost all of them generate 70 or 80 percent of their revenue from foreign countries. And global outsourcing, both BPO and KPO, have become uh, sources for employment for thousands of people in this India's subcontinent. And there's a video of those who want to watch this video can watch. The world sees India as a rising global power. Agricultural sector, I'm going to give you some sectoral perspectives. Agricultural sector has been the traditional export items. And let me tell you, none of the developed countries have self-sufficiency in agricultural sector. So India has exporters of opportunities for, for exporting agricultural products to different developed countries, including US or Europe or Japan. And uh, Textile products, traditional export items from India, a lot of potential. This is also because developed countries, again, developed countries, they don't have textile resources or raw materials. They import from developing countries, and developing countries like China, Bangladesh, or Pakistan, or India uh, have potential for exporting textile garments to developed world because these countries have raw material. In mining and petroleum, most of the Asian countries are import dependent in the sector because these Asian countries, including India, China, and Japan, they don't have energy resources with them, so they depend on other countries. And Indian government has emphasized oil exploration by offering tax holidays for the companies, those who want to invest in the sectors because they want to reduce import dependence in the sector, so companies get tax holidays. Manufacturing sector, China and Japan they have excellent manufacturing sector, whereas India and India have uh, an outstanding manufacturing sector. India has an average manufacturing sector. If I have to rate manufacturing sector in India, China and Japan, I would rate China and Japan with four or five and India with two or three. So manufacturing sector, even though economic reforms in the form of liberalization, privatization, globalization has brought about uh, a lot of changes, manufacturing sector remains as weakness of India's economy, whereas it remains as backbone of Japanese economy or Chinese economy. So which are competitors from Asia for India. And, and some of sector-wise changes, and, and if I have a look at business environment in the sectors, telecom sector, all these sectors have opened up for multinational corporations, and multinational corporations are very, very active in the sectors, either in the form of joint ventures, otherwise uh, in, in, in classic form of FBI by way of their own subsidiaries. In telecom sector, we have seen foreign service providers are operating. In insurance sector, Prudential, ICI, ICI, Tata, IIT, AIT, and Prudential, they are foreign companies. Birla Sun Life, Sun Life is a foreign company, so they are joint venture companies. Retail sector, there was debate going on, and state governments got freedom to do to take decision on FDI in, in retail sector, so like education sector, state governments have got freedom in, in terms of private universities and those kind of things. So in the retail sector, 
the same thing, shared government, shared freedom in India. When we talk about specifically the India's case, tourism sector, government of India has welcomed some specific country citizens to India with a facility visa on arrival. So this was not the case in India. This is first time in the history of India that India's doors are open for foreign tourists without visa. They don't need prayer visa. They used to, all citizens from different countries, they were required to take visa to come to India. But the new changes will facilitate tourism sector as well as, uh, of, you know, all the associated industries like hotel industry and, and hotel industry is also globalized nowadays. And state governments um, in India, unlike the U.S., in the U.S., they have common policies for the entire country when it comes to FDI, when it comes to several things. In India, even for FDI, with the recent decision on FDI in retail, state governments got freedom to take decision whether they have to welcome FDI in the retail sector in different states. So state governments have become more powerful in India with this kind of changes, unlike the U.S. Education sector, as I said, education sector is producing lots of engineering graduates, lots of English speaking graduates in India, the largest number of graduates are from India and, and compared to any other countries. So this helps India to grow. And India's case, when you talk about India's, even China's case is also like this these days. Both India and China have changed the status from shy lady to hugging saints. This is because before 91 or before in, in 70s or 60s, they were keeping distance with the foreign companies. They used to keep distance. They were scared of foreign companies. And, and 91 onwards, India has, uh, or Indian companies, so India INC has started shaking hands with uh, foreign companies uh, with a kind of message they want to pass on is, I would like to do business with you. And uh, post-95, with uh, all the reforms got implemented, India became a member of WTO and those kind of things. Indian uh, companies have become very, very smart. Uh, and, and Indian companies have started uh, talking to the foreign companies with a message that I would love to do business, not just I would like to do business. So from like to love so for international business. Challenges, many business people said so this is specific challenges in India's context is tax challenge and, and, and let me tell you another example, drinking water, Pepsi and Coke, they are American multinationals. So they have appropriate business strategies in the sectors where they do business. They, they are traditional business model, traditional business source of revenue for them are soft drinks. But in India, taking into account the market size, they ventured into mineral water business. And, and they are in cash and they are capitalizing the capabilities they have created in the mineral water segment with their own brands in those industries. Diversify, business diversification, taking into account the need of Deva. This is a strategy they have, they have uh, formulated as part of their business strategy or strategic planning, taking into account changing landscape of business in Indian markets. And they have succeeded in those segments. Yeah, so this is a video I would like to recommend for the students in case if you want to watch uh, a video on how global outsourcing has reshaped the uh, landscape of doing business. America's experts say, they say that there are thousands of jobs arrived in India because of global outsourcing. And India has changed because of global outsourcing. These are the comments by policy makers in the US. They, 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 the very interesting video on the other side of outsourcing. So Bangalore has emerged as a uh, best city in search of jobs in India. It used to be Bombay or Mumbai, but now it is Bangalore because of global outsourcing. So if you have any question, I would like to uh, give you, you know, like uh, my, my, you know, uh, you can ask questions. And you can also note my email if you want to have profjustatu.edu and profjustatgmail.com if you have any questions. And you are also welcome to be my friend. And, and videos, this is uh, two other videos I would like to recommend for you is China introduction video. Uh, this video gives you insights on China because China is emerging. And China is expected to be the single largest economy in the days to come. Currently, <coughs> US is the single largest economy. And China is second largest economy. Japan has become third, has, has uh, slipped down the third largest economy status, even though it was second largest economy for a long time. 
And China Rising, what it means to the world. Very important videos in case if you are a business student in the 21st century. And I can also try to correlate this situation of China and India with the cricket game. Because in India, cricket is very, very popular, right? Um, in, 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 when you play cricket, you have opening batsman, you are second, third and fourth and those kind of things. Uh, British, sorry, not British, Portuguese, French and Spanish, they were the opening batsmen in, in, in the world of business in 17th and 18th century. They were bowled out by British and British became batsmen and British in, in, in 20th century or 19th century and by the end of 20th century British was bowled out by American. An American has been batting over 100 years now and you can try to, you know, and India was one of the fielders or India is, as of now, is one of the fielders because there are 11 fielders, 11 countries, they are trying to be fielders. And India's position in the 70s or 80s where India was sitting as a, you know, uh, India was watching the game sitting in the pavilion. And now India has become bowler and who is, sorry, sorry, fielder. And China, China has got the status of bowler now. China was one of the fielders. And China is trying to bowl US and US is batting. And China is trying their best to, 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 uh, you know, to make sure that the U.S. is out from the court, out from the, uh, you know, uh, um, ground, cricket ground. So, and, and U.S. is still trying to feel, trying, trying to, you know, trying to score four runs and six runs and those kind of things. <laughs> and they are, they are, the, the game, the world of business is between U.S. and China nowadays. It was between US and UK, then it was between, and Japan also came as second largest economy, Japan tried to ball, but Japan never became the batsman, and India is also trying, or waiting for its turn to become bowler, an impossible batsman. So, the world of business is like a, it's like a passenger bus, it's not like Delhi's passenger bus. Delhi's passenger bus sometimes could be risky, right? And uh, the U.S. is sitting in the driver's seat, the world of business can be compared like a bus. So U.S. is sitting in the driver's seat and, and China is a conductor. So my, my time to, I just would like to give you a, a, a suggestion maybe for companies who would like to conclude with these comments. Success strategy, you need to have a success strategy for your company, for yourself. And for companies, organic and inorganic growth are critical, are very, very important, key for success. And because the world has changed, nowadays, if you're not going to grow, someone else will come and eat your business. The catchphrase is to, to eat or to be eaten by others. In other words, in technical words, I can say, if you're not going to outpour someone else's business, someone else will come and up upwear your business. So because mergers and acquisition and amalgamation, these things have become very, very day-to-day -day process these days. And companies, as well as individuals, I would say, hard work and network, success, these two are very important. And work, of course, is prerequisite. And, and networking for success is secondary. So use LinkedIn.com, create your own network for students. I would say that because it helps you somewhere other way to, to collect all your uh, contacts into a single uh, platform and also get some recommendation from your bosses and your managers and this this also helps you to get good jobs and uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, session and I would be happy in case if we have time I'm not sure that we have enough time to answer questions.